Still I rest assured in you Still I will not fear Cause you Are working all for my good Though I've not always understood You are faithful Always faithful You are faithful Always faithful Trust you. Trust you.
And praise the Lord, everyone. Amen. Why don't we stand? Welcome, everyone, to Full Gospel Church. So glad to see everybody here. Man, I'm looking forward to worshiping with you all tonight and, and hearing what the Lord wants to say to each and every one of us. And I'm just looking forward to what the Lord is going to do tonight. Amen. There's something about being excited to be in the house of the Lord. We could be in a thousand different places here tonight, but we chose to come into this place to enter into the presence of the Lord. Because... There's something about being in church. There's something about joining together in worship with our brothers and our sisters. There's something about joining together in worship to our King. Amen. That it, when we come into the house of God, there's peace. There's, there's joy. There's hope. There's, there's life. There's possibilities here today. Amen. And I'm just looking forward to what God is going to do. I guess I'm the only one here tonight who's excited. Me and a couple others, but praise the Lord. Why don't we pray that God would move in this place and that God would open up our hearts to what he wants to do here tonight. And, and we just want to see what he's going to do. Lord Jesus Christ, you are so wonderful, Lord. You are faithful, God. You are merciful. You are holy. You are so, so good to us, Lord. And I just want to pray tonight. Hallelujah. Let there be, Lord, an excitement. Let there be a joy to be in the house of the Lord today, God. Because it's in this place that we can encounter your presence. It's, it's in this place that we can find reprieve from the world around us, Lord. It's in this place, God, that we can find renewed hope. It's here, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. That we can find deliverance. We can find peace and hope and life in this place. Lord, I pray, God, that you would minister in this house. I pray as we sing songs of worship, Lord, let there be unity, God. Let there be worship from the depths of our heart and soul, that it would be more than just words, God, that we sing, that it would be more than lip service here tonight. But God, from our hearts, let us glorify you. Let us magnify you, Lord, in spirit and in truth. You are worthy to be praised. You're worthy to be exalted, Lord. You are a good God, and we love you tonight, Lord. We want you to have your way in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah.
you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Man, I'm so thankful we serve a God that's worthy. He's worthy in the good times and he's worthy in the bad times. There's a line in the song that says, he's worthy of every praise I could ever bring. That means even in the times when we're down and we don't bring him praise, he's still worthy of the praises that we forgot to bring. And I'm so thankful we serve a God that is always worthy. Amen, amen. We want to, I want to echo what our uh, prodigal minister who's come back from overseas said. Welcome everyone to Full Gospel Church. And I'm excited for what God's going to do in this place. I want to remember to pray for uh, Brother Booker as he travels with his district superintendent uh, within that role that God will keep him safe. We want to take a moment, we'll pray for him, and I also want to pray for Brother Wasp, and he's had to go to the hospital. We want to pray that the doctors are able to, to take care of what's going on in his life. Amen? Would you pray with me? Father, Lord, I thank you for what you're doing in this place. Lord, I pray that you would continue to move in a mighty and a powerful way, Lord. I pray that you would keep our hand on our pastor and our pastor's wife as they travel, Lord. Keep them safe, Lord, wherever they go and bring them home safely, Lord. I pray for Brother Wasman, God, that you would have your hand on his life, Jesus. Touch him, God. Bring healing into that situation, Lord. I pray that you would guide the doctor's hands, Lord. Give them strength and ability, Lord, and wisdom to, to in order their steps to bring him back to full health, Lord. I thank you for what you're going to do in his life, Lord. And I thank you for what you're going to do in this place. It's in Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen, amen. Uh, at this time, we want to dismiss nursery, ransom, and Bible quizzing. Nursery, ransom, and Bible quizzing. Everybody run out. And we'll sing another song. Amen. Turn in your Bibles to John chapter 4. John chapter 4, and we'll start reading in verse 6. And as you're turning there, finding your phone, opening the app, closing all the other apps that are making your phone run slow. I, I am really excited about what the Lord has for us today. And this, this message has been burning in me, and I, I feel I have a word for us here today. And John chapter 4, verse 6, it says, Jacob's well was there, so Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside, beside the well. It was about the sixth hour, and a woman from Samaria came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink, for his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said unto him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For the Jews had no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus answered and said, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, draw water with, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and, his, and their livestock. Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never thirst. The water that I will give him will become a spring of water welling up to eternal life. 
the woman said to him, Give me, sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or I have to come here to draw water. Jesus said to her, Go call your husband and come here. The woman answered, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, You're right, saying, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and the one you are now with is not your husband. What you have said is true. From this text, I want to preach for a little while on the message of the unconfirmed faults. The unconfirmed faults. Amen. You may be seated. For many, this is a, this is a familiar story. It's, it's something we've heard many, many messages preached on, things that in a lot of different ways, covering a lot of different topics, a lot of different aspects on it. However, when we really look at this, when we look at the back and forth of this conversation that happens here, it's, it's actually pretty baffling. It, when we look at what's said, it almost looks as if Jesus is talking to someone else other than the woman at the well. Look at what's said. He, he tells her, give me a drink. Why are you talking to me? I'm a, I'm a Samaritan. You should have asked me for a drink. How, how, and I would have given you living water. How would you even get me a drink? You don't have a pitcher. My drink never makes you thirsty. Okay, give me some of your, your water so I don't have to uh, be thirsty anymore. Go call your husband. That, that's probably the most disjointed conversation you'll ever hear. When, when I read this, honestly, if I put myself in that situation, I don't think I would have stuck around until Jesus got to the end. <laughs> Somebody just randomly throws sidetrack topics, and I'm like, yeah, have a good day. <laughs> it's good talking to you, buddy. But when we look at this deeper, there's something just beneath the surface of this seemingly haphazard conversation. See, often when we read a few verses, when we find something we don't understand, we jump ahead in the story, don't we? We look ahead to see what the end of the story is, and then we try to figure out why things got to there, got to that point. It becomes really easy to reverse engineer the story because this is the final result, so this, that must have been the reason why, Right? This was confusing, but if I look at the end of the story, I can kind of figure out the reason we got here. It's, it's logical, it's neat, it's tidy, there's no loose ends, right? This, we got from here to here to here. But that's not how real life happens. Life never goes in a neat, straight line. And in this story, I think doing this misses a powerful message hidden in the dialogue of this encounter. Instead of jumping to the result of the encounter, let's Let's try to get a view of the world that both Jesus and the Samaritan woman were living in. Because it creates a backdrop for understanding the context that, that they're both working in, under. And ultimately, what will end up happening all the way in the book of Acts. See, the sad history of Samaria goes all the way back to the split of Israel into two kingdoms in 930 B.C. The area of Samaria would eventually become the, the capital of the northern kingdom called, uh, named Israel while Jerusalem would remain the capital of the southern kingdom, Judah. It was this later aspect of Jerusalem being the, ca the capital of Judah that started the, de started the demise of the northern kingdom. Because Jeroboam, the first king of the northern kingdom, was afraid that if he allowed his people to go to the temple in Jerusalem to worship, that they would eventually turn their backs on him. So Jeroboam in 1 Kings 12 verse 28 reintroduces the golden calf that had tripped Israel up when they first came out of Egypt. And in a sad stroke of irony, he copies what Aaron said almost word for word when he built the calf the first time. And he presents it to, it presents the golden calf. First Kings 12, 28, he says, Behold thy gods, O Israel, which brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Jeroboam would, would compound the issue and go on to drive out the priests of Levi to solidify the kingdom of Israel to himself because they refused to worship the calves that he had made. And then in, to fill this gap, he took priests from other countries and used them to lead Israel in worship to their God. This act would set a tone for a wicked polluting of the true worship of the entire nation of this northern kingdom. It was such an egregious offense 
that the Bible refers back to this series of events no less than 21 times as the sin of Jeroboam. For the next 200 years, Israel would go from bad king to bad king, never able to shake this foundation of idolatry established by Jeroboam. Nor were they ever able to shake the twisted meshing of religions or beliefs that his actions created. Ultimately, God's mercy would run out on, on Israel, and judgment would be poured out. And this judgment would be accomplished through three different conquests of that northern kingdom by the Assyrians. Each time they would conquer cities, taking inhabitants captive and relocating them, making them uh, slaves for, the, for Assyria. With the final conquest happening in 722 B.C., when the northern kingdom of Israel was ultimately conquered in its entirety. 2 Kings 17, 22 records and it says, For the children of Israel walked in all the sins of Jeroboam, which he did. They departed not from them until the Lord removed Israel out of his sight. As he said by his servants, the prophets, so was Israel carried away out of their own land to Assyria unto this day. And the king of Assyria brought men from Babylon and from Kutha and from Ava and from Hamath and from Sepharvim and placed them in the cities of Samaria instead of the children of Israel. And they possessed Samaria and dwelt in the cities thereof. History says that Assyria did leave some of the lowest income Israelites to live in that land. To, to keep the land so it didn't fall into disarray as, as new people were transported there. And when these five nations we just read about arrived in, in Israel, those Israelites remaining were assimilated into those foreign nations. They married into the cultures. They adopted some of the beliefs. They mixed, they mixed those new beliefs with their already warped version of Judaism established by Jeroboam. The Samaritan culture was an unholy mesh of five different religions and five different cultures, morphed into some concoction of lies and deception that ended up miles away from anything that could even be close to consider true. And 700 years later, by the time Jesus comes along, they were nothing more than an illegitimate union of the holy with the unholy. When the Jew saw a Samaritan, they saw a physical representation of their own failures. Because just like Israel, Judah's idolatry, idolatry ended with them being conquered. In Syria, they saw of Israel representation of all their own past failures. They saw the result of a fractured nation. They saw the results of their own idolatry that led them to be conquered instead of being the conquerors. They saw the results of their refusal to repent. The Samaritans were the very embodiment of all of the nation of Israel's past failures. And because of that, the Jews absolutely hated the Samaritans. They hated this messed up culture. They hated this warped religion. They hated that they were polluting the law of Moses. They hated that the Samaritans reminded themselves of their own weaknesses and failures. Imagine that for a second. Imagine that there was somebody in your life, who is the very embodiment of everything you ever did wrong, of every mistake you had ever made. And now magnify that feeling by the entire, the population of this entire city. That bubbling over of emotion, of anger, of frustration, of resentment is just the beginning of the rawness of this relationship between the Jews and the Samaritans. Because this had 700 years to fester and build up making the Samaritans the absolute scour scourge of the earth in the mind of the Jews. Now that might seem a little extreme, right? It almost paints the Samaritans as, as sympathetic figures. But the truth was, everything we just said was 100% true. They were the remnant of a rebellion that split a nation. They had polluted the name of their God. They had mixed the holy with the unholy. They had refused to repent. They had allowed themselves to be assimilated into different cultures. This wasn't a woe is me, the world's being unfair to me. This scorn, this shame, this constant ostracizing cast on them by the Jews. It hurt so much worse to the Samaritans 
because it was 100% true. They were warped and deluded to the point that they didn't even know who their own identity now was. They were so far away from what they were supposed to be, they had no idea who they really were. The discarded remnant of a once royal nation. Instead, they were just a jumbled up mess of every sin, shameful failure in the history of God's chosen people. And it's in this worldview, in this understanding of this fractured relationship between Israel and Samaria, that our opening text is placed in. And that was just the start of the gap between the Savior and this shame-filled woman at the well. Because not only is she a Samaritan, the scourge of the earth, of, of society, but personally she had enough of her own baggage to match that of her ancestry. See, so there, there's a few things we can piece together from our text. The first thing it was is that she came to the well alone. The second is that she had been married five times, and none of those men were now her husband. And the third was the man that she was now with wasn't her husband either. So we can gather from her history that she was likely no longer a young woman. Because she had lived long enough to see five husbands come and go. So at the very least, we know that she had lived a very, very hard life. It's not easy to go through the loss of five husbands no matter how they're lost. Whether, whether it's through tragedy over and over again, or abandonment, or maybe her own failure, or even promiscuity on either of their parts. In any one of those cases, or any combination of them together, she was sure to be a battered shell of her, once, uh, her old self. Sure to be a battered, battered person compared to what she had once been. There would have been walls built up, walls of resentment. Walls of anger, walls of worthlessness, of guilt, walls of shame, insecurity, withdrawal, walls of depression. We also know from history that drawing water from wells was typically reserved for the younger women. But in her aging years, she was still forced to do this physically tasking errand. In the evening time, the well was supposed to be the place where women wanted to go. It was a place where they went to be seen and be, see each other and be seen. It was typical for what younger women to make their appearance at the well in hope of attracting a husband. But this five times marriage bliss loser didn't go at that time. She didn't go when everyone was there. Instead, she found a time when the parade of eligible bachelorette, bachelorettes hadn't begun. And she traveled to this place of societal hopes completely alone. We don't know if she wasn't welcome. The Bible doesn't tell us that. We don't know if she didn't go because, then because she was ashamed or if she was too proud to go in the evening. But we do know that she didn't go with everybody else. As a shrinking violet, she was an outcast among outcasts. The Samaritans were rejected by everybody, and she was rejected by the Samaritans. The woman Jesus asked for a drink of water from was at the very bottom end of the bottom rung of the ladder of life. Simply put, she was the lowest possible low. And with this as a background, we can start to understand her response to Jesus' request for water. When she says, how is it that you ask me for anything? Your people don't associate with people like me. Let me help you out. Let me save you some embarrassment. I'm a Samaritan. I'm the representation of everything wrong to you. I'm not supposed to be even worthy of you asking me to get you some water. Maybe if life hadn't beaten her down so much, she would have snapped, snapped back at him in the ugliness that befitted the relationship between the Jews and the Samaritans. But her only dignity left was to remind him of her faults in his eyes and save them both the embarrassment of this encounter. And here we're left with a shattered and broken woman and a Savior that simply wants to heal her. 
See, Jesus' first response to her revelation of her failure is this. If you knew the power of God, if you knew me, I would have given you living water if only you'd asked. See, she was telling him, I'm not good enough. Just look at who I am. Look at what my life's become. But that didn't matter to Jesus. It's as if he was saying, yes, you're a Samaritan. Yes, your life's a mess. But this isn't about you. See, she was telling Jesus, I'm not good enough for you. But Jesus didn't even dignify that statement by confirming it or denying it. He didn't even acknowledge it because it simply did not matter. Instead, he pointed her away from her shortcomings and pointed her to himself. See, we need to, we need to understand this. Her faults had no bearing on her ability in Jesus. It didn't matter what her history was. It didn't matter her pain. It didn't matter her past failures. It didn't matter who had abandoned her or, or who had misused her. It didn't matter what she had done or even who she was. Her mess is not in the way of, her, of his miracle. All she had to do was get her eyes off the mess, get her eyes off of the problem, and put her eyes on Jesus. See, Jesus was making the same call to this woman that he made when he wept over in Jerusalem in Matthew 11 when he said, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon me, upon you, and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly at heart. You will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Please just let me help you. Your weakness is not my limitation. See, for us as a church to make the impact that we're called to make, we have to step out with the understanding that God is not burdened by my faults and my failures. He's not burdened by my mistakes. He's not burdened by my inadequacies. He's not held back by my, my mistakes or my missteps. The impact he's calling us to do to is to simply, uh, it, it's simply a matter of stepping out and letting God do what he wants to do. So now the woman at the well hearing this, she tries a different approach. Instead of pointing to her weaknesses, now she looks for the obstacles. He didn't have a pitcher to draw water with. Surely this man asking for water wasn't able to meet her need. And once again, Jesus simply bypasses what she sees as the obstacle. His reply is, don't worry about the well. Don't worry about that bucket. That's just a temporary fix to a temporary problem. I want to build a well inside of you that will nourish your soul forever. I want to put something in you that's never going to dry up. See, the first excuse was about her weakness. And this time, it's about her circumstance. And Jesus was letting her know, you don't have to worry about the circumstances. You don't have to worry about the obstacles. It's not about your situation. Trials and difficulties, those come and they go. But I have something for you that goes far beyond what's going on in your life. She was saying it's not possible, but Jesus was saying it doesn't matter what you think is possible. It doesn't matter what you have or what you don't have. It doesn't matter what your family may or may not think. It doesn't matter what coworkers think you can do or you can't do. My gift is not dependent on your ability or inability. My blessing goes far beyond the, the boundaries of your limitations. What I have for you is going to change your life forever. But your weaknesses, they don't need to deter you. Your, your faults, your shortcomings, your circumstances, they don't have to define you. All you need to do is step out and step into the life that I'm calling you to live. And in John 4, 15, she takes that step. No more focus on our weaknesses. No more questions about circumstances. Her reply is just, give me this water so that I don't have to thirst again. See, she doesn't, she doesn't quite get what Jesus is talking about. But when God showed me what happened next, it blew my mind. What does Jesus do? He calls her to ask for her husband. I'd always assumed that Jesus was doing this to to prove his divinity to her, right? He wanted to show her his knowledge. But I realize that doesn't really line up with Scripture, does it? Never once does God do something to prove himself to humanity. Never. See, that's a human concept. We say, prove it to me and then I'll believe. But all through the Scripture, it's God says, believe in me and I'll prove it to you. 
So he wasn't trying to prove himself to this woman at the well. So that, under, that, that understanding just doesn't line up with Scripture. Now, I, I think God was revealing something totally different to her. And I believe her reaction tells us that she understood at least in part some of what he was saying. He asked for her husband, and, re, and she replies, I don't have one. And Jesus tells her, you're right. You used to have five, and the one you're with now, you don't belong to. Listen, Jesus was tearing down some serious walls here. Did you ever find it odd that she had five husbands? That's a lot. That's a lot in today's day and age. Much less in a society where the women didn't have power or control. She couldn't leave her husband at any time she wanted. They either had to die or she had to be rejected. That was the only way in and out of her marriage in that day. See, this is, more about, more, this is about more than some bad husbands. There was a 700-year-old barrier that was being shattered in this moment. See, her tragic life mirrored the tragic history of the Samaritan people as a whole. She had had five husbands. The remnant of the northern kingdom was assimilated by five countries. And now she lived with a man that she didn't belong to. And the Samaritan people worshipped a the God they didn't know and they didn't belong to. See, what Jesus was telling her is, I know your history. I know the history of your people. I know your family. I understand the issues. I understand the problems. But what you are right now, that's not who you have to be. Right now, you're bound by a false husband. Your people are bound by a false religion. But you don't need to be bound by those relationships. You don't need to be bound by that life of sin. You don't need to be tied down by whatever your history was. And your people don't need to be bound to that life of shame. Yes, that is what you are. It does, but it doesn't need to, be, need to define who you will be. And look at her response in John 4, 20. She said, our fathers worshiped in this mountain, and you say that in Jerusalem is a place where men ought to worship. Look at the shift in the conversation. See, no longer is it about her weaknesses. No longer is it about her limitations. No longer is it about her, it's not about her barriers. It's not about wells and water anymore. She made the connection to where he was going because now her focus shifts from her to her, Samar her Samaritan family. She shifted her focus from fear to making an impact. She began to realize that this wasn't about well water, but instead it was about a different kind of fountain. And she also recognized a shift from just being about herself to impacting everyone around her. And look at where she went. Okay, if we're not bound by our past, if I'm not limited to my situation, prophet, I need a word. I need you to tell me something. Give me truth. Tell me where to start. Where is worship supposed to begin? I need to impact my world, so tell me what I'm supposed to do. And Jesus brings this conversation full circle to its climax. In John 4, 22, he says, you worship what you know, now what? We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews, but the hour cometh and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father th seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. For the first time in this conversation, Jesus acknowledges the fault. See, her weaknesses, those didn't matter. Her history, that didn't matter. Her past failures, those don't matter. Life circumstances, that doesn't matter. But truth, truth matters. Yes, you and your people, you were deceived. Yes, salvation is of the Jews. But there's a change coming on the horizon. It's not going to be about who you are, where you're from. But truth, truth is going to still matter no matter what happens. I will put my spirit in you and truth is going to matter. I'm coming, I'm set, shedding my blood for you, and truth is going to matter. See, we're at a point in time where the, the church and the saints of God are facing critical steps as we navigate a world that's constantly shifting. We live in a world that's changing every day, not for the better. And if we're honest with ourselves too often, we find ourselves just trying to survive, just trying to get to the next day, just trying to make it through the situations that we're facing. Frustrated with, with what we find ourselves in. Frustrated by what we have to face, what we have to deal with. 
Or you worse yet, we allow the difficulties and we allow time to numb our spiritual senses. But listen, this isn't a new thing. Because if we're going to be honest with ourselves, we might as well continue, right? Time and again, we find, we find ourselves on the cusp of a breakthrough. And instead of making the impact that we're called to make, we allow our weaknesses to define our steps. We allow our shortcomings to stop us in our progression. We allow our, our, our circumstances to define our future. And our culture defines our Christianity instead of God defining our culture. And our failures begin to seal our focus. See, life happens and without even realizing it. We turn back to the old routines of looking for, looking to the old wells that we know for our water. We go to the things that used to quench our thirst. And when the Spirit of God moves, we find ourselves wondering what's wrong and why don't we feel Him like, like we used to? How do we fall so far away from God? As we move forward in our lives, we have to remember that the main goal of the enemy is to get our focus off of God and on ourselves. Tying us up with inactivity as we try to hide our weaknesses. Keeping us from making an impact in the world around us as we, we try to cover up whatever's wrong in our life. We try to get caught up fixing all of our issues. Fixing our problems. Making ourselves better so I, I can do this a little bit better for God. Perfecting all the scenarios of our life. Getting everything in the perfect line. Building up our repertoires to something that we think that God can use. We put everything in an order because now, now, I, now I have this right. Now God can use me. But let me remind you of the old adage. We don't get good to get God. We get God to get good. It isn't time to be tied up with all the mess that the enemy is throwing our way. Because those weaknesses, those stumbling blocks, those situations, those circumstances, the everyday cares of life, they don't really matter. We need to understand, yes, we are weak. Yes, we struggle. Yes, we have failures. Yes, there are obstacles in the way. But my weakness is not his limitation. My difficulty doesn't hold him back. My circumstances do not dictate his blessing in my life. So as our world moves more and more into chaos, now is not the time to step back and let the world around us flutter, flounder. It's time for us to live a life of impact to the world around us. To live a life of spirit in, in spirit and in truth. And when we live that way, that will impact the people around us. We don't have to worry about how many doors am I knocking on. Because if I'm living a life of spirit and in truth, that's going to shine a light to the world around me. We don't have to get caught up on, I haven't done this or I haven't done that. Your limitation is not going to limit God. What I have done or haven't done, that's not going to stop God. If I live a life in spirit and in truth, then he's going to open those doors for me. I, I, I understand that everything happening around us, listen, I get that it can be discouraging. It's not easy. But we have to understand that just because you may not see the bucket yet, it doesn't mean that God has, doesn't have the well-primed. Let me say that again. Just because you may not see the bucket in God's hands doesn't mean he doesn't have the well ready for an outpouring of his spirit into your life and the life of those around you. Too often we stop stepping where God's called us to step because we don't see the bucket that we think needs to be there. We don't see the thing that we think we need to accomplish what God's called us to. But it was never about what we can do in the first place. It was about us stepping out of the way and saying, God, I'll allow you to step into this situation. This, this is our time to make the impact in the world around us. It's time for us to impact our friends and our family, our co-workers. Living a life of the Spirit and truth will affect everyone we come in contact with. If we're willing to walk the way and allow God to direct our lives.
And this is exactly where the city of Samaria finds itself when Jesus leaves. Sitting on the edge of a promise. A promise of an impact in their lives and in their world. As we begin to close, you stand with me and the musicians come. See, so often this is, this is where we think the story of the woman at the well stops. But it's important to understand that this is not the end of her story. This is not the end of the story of the Samaritans. See, as Pentecostals, when we read the book of Acts, we naturally, we focus on Acts chapter 2, don't we? We read it where 2,000 people were added to the church. We celebrate that. It's incredible. It's great. And we keep moving on, and we look in Acts chapter 4 where 5,000 people are saved. And that's great. That's powerful. But it's a continuation and the conclusion of the impact of the woman at the well with all of her faults, with all of her failures, with all of her shortcomings, with all the impossible obstacles that were in her way. Her own life, her marriage that made her, made her the, uh, 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 ostracized in her own society. A society that was ostracized by everybody else around them. Her odds were impossible. But it's a continuation of her story that's the greatest revival in the book of Acts. Because her story picks back up when Philip flees Jerusalem because of persecution that's happening there. And following the steps of his Savior, he enters into Samaria in Acts chapter 8. With Jesus having laid the soil barren, fertilized, waiting to, the people there are waiting to receive the seed of the gospel. And the Bible tells us that when Philip preaches the word with one accord, the entire city responds and is baptized. The entire city of Samaria responds and is baptized. See, this is a true impact of a life lived in spirit and in truth. This is a true impact of the story of the woman at the well. When she surrendered her faults, when she surrendered her failures to Jesus, and instead worshiped in spirit and truth, regardless of what her perception was, regardless of what seemed like was happening around her. Her impact affected everyone that was around her. It affected her family. It affected her city. And it resulted in every one of them coming to the knowledge of truth. That's the kind of impact that God has empowered us to walk in. That's the impact that he's calling you and I to have in our lives. We don't have to see the we don't have to see the fruit of it. The woman at the well may not have been there when Philip came in Acts chapter 8. But the seeds she sowed brought such a huge blessing that her entire city was blessed. As we close it, I challenge us to find a place to pray. See, God is calling each of us to impact the world around us. He's calling us to find a place in Him where we're living in His spirit and in truth. I challenge you to, to find a place in God and, and see what He's calling you to make, the step He's calling you to make. Seek His face and ask Him to be alive in your life. That your sacrifices, that the things you're doing in Him, they won't end here today. But living the life in spirit and in truth is going to open the doors that you've been hoping for. Opening the doors for others to receive the gospel of Jesus. Because this is about so much more than just you or I. It's about a world around us that's lost and dying. That's in pain. That's, in, that's suffering because of the way we're living life today. And God wants to heal each and every one of us. Listen, the well is truly primed. He's just asking for us to be willing to step out and see what he'll do. Because he wants something for each and every one of us. Everything is changing now. Everything is changing now. The Spirit of the Lord is here. The Spirit of the Lord is here. The miracles are breaking out. The presence is among us. Spirit of the Lord is here. The Spirit of the Lord is here. Everything.
Everything is changing now. Everything is changing now. The Spirit of the Lord is here. The Spirit of the Lord is here. Miracles are breaking now. Your presence is among us. Jesus. There's a freeing principle in the Word of God. And that's the principle of obedience. It's probably not what you thought I was going to say. But what's really interesting is all we are called to do is what we're called to do. And that means God takes care of absolutely everything else. That is one of the most liberating things we could ever face. Sometimes we put more on ourselves than God's ever called us to do. As we go out in the world around us, I challenge you, put God to the test. Strive to walk in spirit and truth and see what he'll do in your life. See what he'll do when the, your family is around you. Amen. We love you guys. So glad the Kingsburys are home safely. He's not really a prodigal. Tell them that you love them. Tell everybody else that you love them. Dismissed in Jesus' name. God bless you.